Hi, I'm Bridget Johansson. Uh, I live Red Deer County, Alberta. I'm 34 weeks pregnant and I'm recovering from COVID-19. My name is Thomas McCallum. I live in Calgary, Alberta, and I am the father of a heart and double lung transplant recipient. Hi, my name is uh, Amy Mendenhall. I live in Lethbridge, Alberta, and yesterday morning uh, I lost my dad. Uh. Hit, feel like you've been hit by a bus. You just don't know what's what's to come next and if you're going to make it out on the other side. So I wanted to wait before I got vaccinated. So if something did go sideways, you know, baby would have a better chance of survival. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I guess, top priority uh, when it should have been. When I went to the Oles Hospital the first uh, time, there was an obstetrician on actually she you know assessed me said i want you to go get a pulse oximeter monitor i want you to start monitoring your oxygen level if it drops you know below 94 i want you back in here within a day and a half uh, my family doctor had called she said uh, i want you to hang up the phone Call 911 and uh, get assessed. So that's what we did. I was in an ambulance and on my way to the Foothills Hospital that afternoon. So when I got unloaded under out of the ambulance and they wheel everybody on their stretchers down into triage, there was stretchers of people. Stretchers. I just literally started crying and he said to the uh, ambulance attendant, I looked at him and said, am I going to make it out of here alive? Yeah. You know how to hold your crayon. After two days or three days, uh, I was stable on room air above 94, 92, 94. So they discharged me. My chest just felt super tight. I felt like I couldn't get any air into my bottom lobes. So I said to my nurse, before I go home, do you mind just listening to my chest? And I was readmitted that night with COVID pneumonia. I just was so scared. <laughs> I said to the nurse, I have two little boys at home, an amazing husband. I got to get home to them. And she said, I know you will. We just got to, we just got to get it treated and, and get through this. So since I've been home, um, I've just been exhausted. I've got that chest tightness all the time. I still monitor my uh, oxygen stats with a uh, finger monitor. I am worried if I ever had to go back to hospital right now, like the situation that it's in, you know, they're moving people out of province and it's just not a good situation. My daughter Shan is um, currently 14 years old. Zero, right? She received a oh. double lung heart transplant in 2011. She was booked for a uh, heart catheter and the procedure requires her to have an ICU bed on standby in case she was to have an issue in the operating room there. Due to that, she has they had to cancel it to make the beds available. If the scar tissue was to build up inside of her, inside of her coronary arteries, it's going to go to the point where restrict, air, restrict blood flow to her body. And it definitely is stressful trying to figure out um, how to best take care of your child. Where can you go to actually get care for her? Will you get turned away? She is in a lot of pain. We went to the hospital 
for a checkup last week and they said that she there's not much they can do at the current time and that she needs to go home and just take it easy but hearing your daughter scream in pain every night because she needs she doesn't feel good she collapsed back in 2011 uh she cardiac arrested we are concerned like if she was to have an episode and she has to be hospitalized right away she might have to sit waiting in a, hall, in a hallway somewhere or transferred to uh, Toronto, right? As a parent, we're scared that we won't be able to see her. My dad had a workplace injury and he had diabetes and kidney issues. He started not being able to walk correctly. Like he was, my mom said he fell when he went into the vehicle, the family doctor, um, did some tests and she said you need to go you need to go by ambulance to the hospital and the ambulance uh, drivers had said like you have a better chance of getting into the hospital and not be in the waiting room if you come in an ambulance and so he agreed because they said like you need to go because his white blood cell count was too high because which was pointing to infection and so when he got in they they figured they think they thought where they found the infection and so they had done a surgery and it was okay and he was fine and she said that he his lungs had started to fail and they said there's no there's no space there's 28 people in the ICU there's 10 beds in the ICU and he he's just not going to get there he's not going to get in that room and so they decided to try BiPAP to help and again they said like he needs respiratory support but the people are busy they're busy in the icu with all these patients and they got there eventually but it wasn't like you call them and they're here it was there's 28 people that are dying that also need their support and then sunday was okay and then i and mon or monday was okay and then I got the call yesterday morning at 2.30. They had said, he had said no more. He had asked if everybody knew. And they made him comfortable. And then he passed away yesterday morning. The loss of my dad just, it's, I can't, I don't have words to say what it means. He, he's my dad. And knowing that my dad should have got an ICU bed and could have benefited from an ICU bed. It makes me angry, but it makes me, it makes me angry and it makes me sad because this was completely preventable. I want people to know that COVID is Israel. Just get the vaccine. I, uh, I don't know why I held off and, uh, Looking back, I wish I wouldn't have. I want people to understand their choices that they're making doesn't it just affect them, it affects everyone. I'm speaking not just for my dad now, I'm speaking for all of these people in the hospital that deserve care. Please, please get vaccinated and give them a chance. And so Albertans are dying from COVID-19 at three times the national rate as ICU numbers are stubbornly high but steady. Joining us now for what this is all like for the ICU teams, Dr. Darren Markland, an intensive care doctor and nephrologist at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton. So Dr. Markland, I know you had an ICU shift this morning and I'm curious about what struck you about it today. I think the first thing is that I walked into a brand new unit today. We've opened our fourth intensive care unit and it's in the basement of the hospital. And then I walked through those doors, I was just surprised how everybody looked the same. Uh, we have barrack style uh, intensive care unit with patients lined up and they all have the same phenotype. They all have the same disease and it's actually a challenge to keep them separate. You, you've been tweeting a lot of, throughout this and one of the things you, you tweeted recently is that the journey of dying in the ICU from COVID-19 takes on average about six weeks. I have seen what that does to families. What do people need to know about what those six weeks are like for the families, but also for people like you? 
I think this is the perfect example of doing things for your family. These, this is a preventable disease. And though these people are very well cared for, they're effectively comatose through most of it. And they don't experience this journey, but their families certainly do. And the trauma, both emotionally and physically, I watch these people just being drained of, of their life force. Just, it's, it's hard. And it leaves a, a scar that I think will affect these families for the rest of their lives. This is completely preventable. And I think if people truly, truly care for their loved ones, they would incorporate that into their decisions about getting vaccinated. And when we hear, sir, that the Canadian Armed Forces is planning, you know, to send up to eight critical care nurses to ICUs in Alberta, what kind of difference will that make? Well, I thank them. I think that it's fantastic. We actually participate in training them and keeping them ready at the Alex, so we're familiar with some of these people. But the grand scheme of things, this is a drop in the bucket. Uh, we need our political willpower not to secure us more human resources yes that's needed but we need that energy placed in policy so that we can actually fix the disease and not scrape away at the tumor all right dr marklin thank you very much get some sleep if you can i appreciate it thank you